the Egyptian Hittite Peace Treaty which was concluded between Egyptian Pharaoh Ramesses II and Hittite King Hattusili III. According to most Egyptologists it was concluded in or around 1259 BC, marking the official end of negotiations and Ramesses II's acceptance from Hittite diplomats of a silver tablet on which the terms were inscribed. The location where the treaty was signed is uncertain. Its purpose was to establish and maintain peaceful relations between the parties. It was the first known diplomatic agreement from the Near East, and it is the oldest written treaty to survive to date. Sometimes called the Treaty of Kadesh, after the Battle of Kadesh fought some 16 years earlier. The treaty itself did not bring about a peace, in fact, an atmosphere of enmity between Hatti and Egypt lasted many years, until the eventual treaty of alliance was signed. In Egypt it was inscribed on the walls of temples in hieroglyphics, while in the Hittite capital of Hattu so it was preserved on baked clay tablets. Archaeological excavations at the Hittite royal palace uncovered it among the palace's sizable archives. The Egyptian version of the peace treaty was engraved on the walls of Pharaoh Ramesses II's mortuary temple in Thebes. Translation of the text revealed that this engraving was originally translated from the silver tablet given to Ramesses II, but had since been lost to contemporary historians. The scribes who engraved the Egyptian version of the treaty included descriptions of the figures and seals that were on the tablet that the Hittites delivered. Two of the tablets of today displayed at the Museum of the Ancient Orient, part of the Istanbul Archaeology Museums. The third is on display in the Berlin State Museums in Germany. A copy of this treaty is prominently displayed on a wall in the United Nations headquarters in New York City. Background. The treaty was signed to end a long war between the Hittite Empire and the Egyptians, who had fought for over two centuries to gain mastery over the lands of the eastern Mediterranean. The conflict culminated with an attempted Egyptian invasion in 1274 BC that was stopped by the Hittites of the city of Kadesh on the Orontes River in what is now Syria. The Battle of Kadesh resulted in both sides suffering heavy casualties, but neither was able to prevail decisively in either the battle or the war. The conflict continued inconclusively for about 15 more years before the treaty was signed. Although it is often referred to as the Treaty of Kadesh, it was actually signed long after the battle and Kadesh is not mentioned in the text. The treaty is thought to have been negotiated by intermediaries without the two monarchs ever meeting in person. Both sides had common interests in making peace. Egypt faced a growing threat from the Sea Peoples, while the Hittites were concerned about the rising power of Assyria to the east. The treaty was ratified in the 21st year of Ramses II's reign and continued in force until the Hittite Empire collapsed 80 years later. Pre-Ramesses II relationship with the Hittites Hittite-Egyptian relations officially began once the Hatti took over Mitanni's role as the ruling power in central Syria and from there tensions would continue to be high until the conclusion of the treaty nearly 100 years later. During the invasion and eventual defeat of Mitanni, the Hittite armies poured into Syria and began to exert their rule over the Egyptian vassals of Kadesh and Amuru. The loss of these lands in northern Syria would never be forgotten by the Egyptian pharaohs and their later actions demonstrated that they never would fully concede this loss at the hands of the Hittite Empire. Egypt's attempts to regain the territory lost during the rule of Akhenaten continued to be futile until under the leadership of Seti I. The father of Ramesses II did significant gains start to be made. In his own Kadesh Amuru campaign against the Hittite armies, Seti I vanquished his foes at a battle near Kadesh. But the gains proved short-lived since Kadesh was eventually given up by Seti in a later treaty. The short gain by the Egyptians was the opening salvo of a conflict between the two nations, which would drag on over the next two decades. Battle of Kadesh The accounts of this battle mainly are derived from Egyptian literary accounts known as the Bulletin and the Poem as well as 
pictorial reliefs on the Ram Messium. Unfortunately for scholars and individuals interested in the Battle of Kadesh, the details that these sources provide a heavily biased interpretation of the events. Since Ramesses II had complete control over the building projects, the resources were used for propagandistic purposes by the pharaoh, who used them to brag about his victory at Kadesh. It is still known that Ramesses marched through Syria with four divisions of troops in the hopes of destroying the Hittite presence there and restoring Egypt to the preeminent position it had enjoyed under Tuthmosis III. The Hittite king, Muwatali II, gathered together an army of his allies to prevent the invasion of his territory. At the site of Kadesh, Ramesses foolishly outdistanced the remainder of his forces and, after hearing unreliable intelligence regarding the Hittite position from a pair of captured prisoners, the pharaoh pitched camp across from the town. The Hittite armies, hidden behind the town, launched a surprise attack against the Ammon division and quickly sent the division scattering. Although Ramesses tried to rally his troops against the onslaught of the Hittite chariots, it was only after the arrival of relief forces from Amuru that the Hittite attack was thrown back. Although the Egyptians were able to survive a terrible predicament in Kadesh it was not the splendid victory that Ramesses sought to portray but, rather a stalemate in which both sides sustained heavily losses. After an unsuccessful attempt to gain further ground the following day, Ramesses headed back south to Egypt bragging about his individual achievements during Kadesh. Even though Ramesses technically won the battle, he ultimately lost the war. When Muwatali and his army retook Amuru and extended the buffer zone with Egypt further southward, Subsequent campaigns into Syria despite suffering the later losses during his invasion of Syria, Ramesses II launched another campaign in his eighth year of rule, which proved largely successful. Instead of launching an attack against the heavily fortified position of Kadesh or going through Amuru, Ramesses conquered the city of Dapur in the hope of using the city as a bridgehead for future campaigns. After the successful capture, Dapur the army returned to Egypt and so the recently acquired territory reverted to Hittite control. In the tenth year of his rule, he launched another attack on the Hittite holdings in central Syria, and yet again, all areas of conquest eventually returned to Hittite hands. The pharaoh now recognized the impossible task of holding Syria in such a fashion and so ended the northern campaign. The period is notable in the relationship between the Hittites and the Egyptians because despite the hostilities between the two nations and military conquests in Syria, Kadesh had been the last direct official military confrontation fought among the Hittites and Egyptians. In some regards, as historians have noted, the period could be considered Cold War between Hatti and Egypt. Discovery The Egyptian version of the peace treaty was preserved on a wall in the Temple of Amun at Karnak. AMD other copies are in temples at Luxor and Abydos. Jean-Francois Champollion copied a portion of the Accord in 1828 and published his findings in 1844. The Egyptian account described a great battle against the great king of Kati, then an unknown figure, later confirmed by other archaeological evidence to be the Hittite monarch Muwatali II. In 1906-1908, the German archaeologist Hugo Winkler excavated the site of the Hittite capital, Hattusa in conjunction with Theodore Macready the second director of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. The joint Turkish-German team found the remains of the Royal Archives, where they discovered 10,000 clay tablets documenting many of the Hittites' diplomatic activities. The hall included three tablets on which the text of the treaty was inscribed in the Akkadian language, a lingua franca of the time. Winkler immediately grasped the significance of the discovery a marvelously preserved tablet which immediately promised to be significant. One glance at it and all the achievement of my life faded into insignificance. Here it was something I might have jokingly called a gift from the fairies. Here it was, 
Ramsey's writing to Hatchuzelis about the joint treaty. Confirmation that the famous treaty which we knew from the version carved on the temple walls at Karnak might also be illuminated from the other. Wise. Ramses is identified by his royal titles and pedigree exactly as in the Karnak text of the treaty. Hatchuzelis is described in the same way, the content is identical, word for word with parts of the Egyptian version, and written in beautiful cuneiform and excellent Babylonian. As with the history of the people of Hatti, the name of this place was completely forgotten. But the people of Hatti evidently played an important role in the evolution of the ancient Western world, and though the name of this city and the name of the people were totally lost for so long, their rediscovery now opens up possibilities we cannot yet begin to think of. Texts The first translation of the Akkadian version of the treaty was published in 1916 by E.F. Wadener. It is the only ancient Near Eastern treaty for which both sides' versions have survived, enabling the two to be compared directly. It was structured to be an almost entirely symmetrical treaty, treating both sides equally and requiring them to undertake mutual obligations. There are a few differences, for instance, the Hittite version adopts a somewhat evasive preamble, asserting that, as for the relationship between land of Egypt and the Hatti land, since eternity the god does not permit the making of hostility between them because of a treaty valid forever, by contrast. The Egyptian version states straightforwardly that the two states had been at war. The treaty proclaims that both sides would in future forever remain at peace, binding the children and grandchildren of the parties. They would not commit acts of aggression against each other. They would repatriate each other's political refugees and criminals and they would assist each other in suppressing rebellions. Each would come to the other's aid if threatened by outsiders. And if another enemy come against the land of Hatti, the great king of Egypt shall send his troops in his chariots and shall slay his enemy and he shall restore confidence to the land of Hatti. The text concludes with an oath before a thousand gods, male gods and female gods of the lands of Egypt and Hatti, witnessed by the mountains and rivers of the lands of Egypt, the sky, the earth, the great sea, the winds, the clouds, if the treaty was ever violated. The oath-breaker would be cursed by the gods who shall destroy his house, his land and his servants. Conversely, he who maintained his vows would be rewarded by the gods who will cause him to be healthy and to live. Content The Peace Treaty of Ramesses II and Hatchuzelis III is known as one of the most important official international peace treaties between two great powers from the ancient Near East because its exact wording is known to us. Divided into points the treaty flows between the Egyptians and Hittites as each side makes pledges of brotherhood and peace to the other in terms of the objectives. The treaty can be seen as a promise of peace and alliance since both powers make the mutual guarantee that neither would invade the other's land. This provision ensures that both participants would act in harmony regarding the disputed Syrian holdings and in effect establishes boundaries for the two conflicting claims. No longer, according to the treaty, would costly Syrian campaigns be waged between the two Near Eastern powers as a formal renunciation of further hostilities is made. A second clause promotes alliance by making reassurances of aid, most likely military support. If either party is attacked by a third party or by internal forces of rebellion or insurgency, the other stipulations coincide with Hatshuzelis' aims in that the Hittite ruler placed great emphasis on establishing legitimacy for his rule. Each country swore to the other to extradite political fugitives back to their home country and within the Hittite version of the Treaty Ramesses II, agreed to provide support to Hatshuzelis' successes in order to hold the Hittite throne against dissenters. After the conclusion of the provision detailing the extradition of emigrants to their land of origin, the two rulers call upon the respective gods of Hatti and Egypt to bear witness to their agreement. 
The inclusion of the gods is a common feature in major pieces of international law since only a direct appeal to the gods could provide the proper means to guarantee adherence to the treaty. Their noted ability to bestow curses and blessings to people is employed as a serious penalty that would be imposed in case of a violation. Analysis theories about the treaty Previous and contemporary Egyptologists have argued over the correct labeling of the treaty. Some have interpreted it as a treaty of peace while others have seen it as a treaty of alliance between two hostile states. James Breasted in 1906 was one of the first people to collect the historical documents of ancient Egypt in an anthology and understood the treaty to be not only a treaty of alliance, but also a treaty of peace, and the war, Ramesses' Syrian campaigns, evidently continued until the negotiations for the treaty began. For Breasted the intermediate periods of conflict were directly resolved by the signing of the treaty and therefore required the treaty to be one of both alliance and peace. However later Egyptologists and other scholars began, even within 20 years of Breasted's publishing, to question whether or not the treaty between Ramesses II and Hatshuzel is three to be one of peace at all. Alan Gardner and his partner S. Langdon examined previous interpretations and determined that their predecessors had misinterpreted the line to beg peace in the text. The oversight in the language caused Egyptologists to incorrectly see the treaty terminating a war instead of seeking a beneficial alliance between Hatti and Egypt. Trevor Bryce further argues that within the late Bronze Age treaties were established for reasons of expediency and self-interest, the concern was much more with establishing strategic alliances than with peace for its own sake. The consensus that is starting to emerge is that although the treaty mentions establishing brotherhood and peace forever, it is not about peace but rather about forming a mutually beneficial alliance between the two powers. Another matter that has caused scholars to speculate is which of the two countries pursued negotiations first. As previously mentioned, Ramesses II had lost portions of his Syrian territory when he retreated to Egypt at the conclusion of the Battle of Kadesh. In this sense, Hatshuzelis would have had the upper hand in the negotiations. Considering Ramesses' desires to emulate the militaristic successes of Tuthmosis III, until the 1920s, Egyptologists had mistaken the insecurity of Egypt's Syrian holdings to mean that Ramesses had come to Hatshuzelis begging for a solution to the Syria problem. Donald Magnati brings up the point that the pharaoh's duty to bring mortal activity in line with the divine order through the maintenance of Mart would have been reasoned enough for Ramesses II to pursue peace. However, the interpretation is incorrect since the questions about Hatshuzelis's legitimacy as monarch would demand recognition by his fellow royals in the Near East. The weak position abroad and at home that defined his reign suggests that it was the Hatti leader who sued for peace. In fact, Trevor Bryce interprets the opening lines of the treaty to be, Ramesses, beloved of Amon, great king, king of Egypt, hero, concluded on a tablet of silver with Hatshuzelis, great king, king of Hatti his brother, to enforce that the incentives of the Hatti ruler had far greater implications that compelled him to sue for peace.